HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. Welcome to The Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Isabella Geron. We'll talk to Isabella about raw wine and a lot more. We're going to taste a wine blind. Isabella won't tell me what it is, so we'll sip it and talk about it during the show. And then at the end of the weekly wine sip, you know, we'll reveal what it is and tell you a little about it. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. Isabella Geron needs no introduction to the great nation audience. She's a master of wine, author, founder of Raw Wine and the Raw Wine Fairs, a wine consultant, oversees the Raw Wine Club. She is a true advocate of organic farming practices and proper living wines. Raw Wine is coming to New York, November 12th and 13th, Toronto, November 15th, Montreal, 18th and 19th of November, and Berlin for December 3rd. Isabella has four Raw Wine fairs scheduled through June 2024, including Tokyo and Copenhagen. Hagen, Hagen, Copenhagen, okay. Los Angeles, Paris. <laughs> right. Um, I didn't list everything, but December 3rd is Berlin. Does that end? Uh, that ends the year. It yes. Does. Okay. Um, and we'll tell everyone where to go, you know, because we're talking to the world. All right. So let's get started. Welcome back yes. to the Grape Nation. We I'm, were talking offline. This could be maybe your fourth, fifth time. And I think the first time I spoke to you, you were rolling in with your first fair. That's right. That was probably in 2016. Yes. Could that be? Yep. It, it, it mm. could have been late 2000 because I started the show September of 2016. So maybe it was, you know, that November. All right. So it's obviously an annual thing when you come to New York <laughs> to is. do the fair that you come on the Grave Nation. Whether you like it or not, I'm going to make you do it. So <laughs> tough. Um, no, I really look forward to it. It's one of my highlights when I come to New York. I know, I know I'm going to be sitting down with Sam and catching up on, on a bunch of stuff. I, I so love hearing you. that. And what's nice is we're talking in New York. We're talking at probably one of the OG natural wine bars in New York, 10 Bells. And a couple of arm lengths away from me is our friend Sev Peru. So hello and thank you to her for uh, having us here. All right. So let's get started here. I told you I want to talk about some general wine stuff and then we'll kind of morph into, you know, raw wine. What's going on? What's new there? Um, This is kind of a general question and one I feel like I have to ask you because I want to get your take on it. But, you know, obviously you've been an advocate of natural wines, as I've mentioned um, before it was a thing. (laughs) You know, you were out there when people are like, what? Um, So. Give me an assessment. And I said this is a general question, so you take it wherever you want. 
of where natural wines are today. And are we still even calling them natural wines? I mean, yeah. I, I use that as the category, but I'm not stuck to it. So, yeah, I mean, I know there's a lot of, you know, discussion around natural wine, where are we at, what's the future and, and, and so on. I mean, look, I think, like you say, you know, I've, I've been working in this, you know, with these growers and trying to promote their work for, you know, uh, the vast majority of my wine career, you know, since I, I started, um, you know, some few, 17, 20 years ago. Um, and things have changed like ra radically, uh, you know, I, I started back in the day where, where you know, it was very easy to get some Auvergnois wines or, or anything from the Jura was hardly selling. And I mean, in fact, we've got Sev here, who I'm sure can testify <laughs> to, to this and, and the journey that, you know, the, the Jura has, 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 has achieved is incredible. So, so the, the landscape looks completely different, um, which, you know, of course, now looking at what's happening with the likes of Auvergnois and, 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 and the frenzy there is around buying them when, you know, is, is, is a different question and whether that's a good thing or not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it's, it is a good thing. Um, but what's for sure is that we, we're now looking at, you know, a generation of, of, of growers who are able to, to, to grow their, 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 their production because there is, you know, there is a, 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 a demand. Um, and, and if you look at the markets around the world, it is popping up everywhere, you know, wherever, you know, next year, you know, as a result, you know, we're now doing an event in, 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 in Paris, in, in Japan, and also in, in Denmark, um, and also carrying on in, in, in Los Angeles. But, you know, I, as I go to, to, to Japan, I'm also going to do an event in, in Taiwan, you know, with, with a few sommeliers and, and, and more of a side event. So there is the, the market is literally has boomed and is everywhere in terms of, of the demand. And, and, and as a result, we are seeing the production really increasing. And to me, that's obviously an, an amaz amazing news because we need, as, as you know, I'm a big uh, proponent of, of organic farming, natural winemaking uh, methods, and we need to, to, uh, to make sure that there is a market for it so that these growers can, can sell um, well, more well, and more of their wine at the correct price, and which is not a given. Uh, because No, I, I want to talk to you about that in a little bit, about accessibility, availability, and pricing. You know, we'll, we'll get to that because, like you said, that's an issue. There are some great wines, you know, that are hard to come um, by. So, but in terms of where, where we are now, I think, I think we are at a, at a, at a difficult point uh, where it's like how, how do we make sure that the things people call natural is indeed natural or even, you know, taste natural. Um, as you know, I, uh, you know, when I, when I onboard new, new growers for the fairs and, and I get a lot of, a lot of demands, you know, I taste everything. Um, and, and I'm seeing a lot of wines that are clearly not made naturally, even though on paper they're farmed organically. They say they do not add, you know, tons of sulfides and everything is fermented naturally. Um, and so yet, how do you know? I think there is there is something that you can you can taste, and I think at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, you know the, the the proof is in the pudding. You know, at the end of the day, you can taste naturalness. You can taste if the but wine wait, is I'm, alive. I'm intrigued by what you just said because if somebody is following the practices, are you implying somewhere along the line they're not, or they're following the practices, but to you it's just not. A well-made wine, no, you I know, which is why you taste everything, and maybe you'd push something aside. Yes, it's because I think there is a um, there is something which is not necessarily on on paper, which is hard to measure, and I've I've looked at that. You know, that's how, what I'm. What is you that? know how how do you measure aliveness, right? Um, and actually, that's a, a very complicated uh, thing because you you can't actually measure, you know whether somebody's added uh, yeast in the fa finished product, because by that stage, the, the yeasts have died and they're, 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 they're metabolized and you can't really, you can't really, you know, uh, look at, you know, look at it on, under a lab. You could look at it whilst the <coughs> one is fermenting because you can measure the yeast population and the diversity of the yeast population. Um, you know, sulfites, you can, you, 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 obviously you can, you can measure or measure, right. uh, you know, on, under the microscope and, and so on. But um, what I mean is, is the, when you taste a wine, there is, A, you can taste 
the farming practices. So, you know, if one of the things that I taste for is, is this wine being really well farmed? And when you put your, your, the wine in your palate, you know, there is a... When, when, when it comes from a, a, a good farming practices and there's terroir, you can taste, and I think we probably discussed that probably last time, you know, the, you can taste complexity, length, uh, all of that you can taste. And, and if you have, you know, a, a, a vineyard farmed with a lot of irrigation and when, when the, the vine is not, is not connected to the soil it's growing in um, and there's no connection, you, you know, you, 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 there is a lack of complexity, uh, minerality in, 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 in the wine, uh, for sure. So, so you can taste farming. So, and one of the questions when I taste wine, I'm like, you know, is what's the farming like? Because if, so, so you can, you know, there's, that's one element that you can question. And, and then it's useful to ask other growers, what do you, what do you know about this, this grower? They're your neighbors. What would you say? Blah, blah, blah. And then there is this thing about, I guess, the naturalness element. Um, I think you, you know, some people can use, it's, it's like, okay, you know, look in your glass, you're, I'm clearly giving you an orange wine, right? right. <laughs> because it clearly looks orange. But orange wine or skin contact as a category has blossomed. I think there's maybe a little bit of fatigue and, and it looks like people are a little bit tired of, of orange wine, which is quite interesting. But there's been this like blossoming of orange wine production in the natural wine world for a number of reasons, you know, because obviously, you know, skins and pips are great antioxidants and, and so on. So it makes sense to use um, more skin and, and pips uh, contact. But if you make an orange wine, so-called orange wine, you know, and, and but you use like very low temperature control, for example. You can leave your wine, like recently I was in Chile and somebody gave me an orange wine and they said, oh, we le- we've left it for, you know, I don't know, 10 weeks or it's 12 a weeks. It's wine. But it's completely cold, cold, cold temperature. There's no color extraction. There's barely any tannins. It doesn't taste like a skin contact. So, you know, the, so, you know, technically speaking, you could say, you know, they probably haven't added any, any yeast and their sulfite totals were, were quite low. But then they, they use, you know, very modern technology of stainless steel temperature control throughout the winemaking process. And when the wine is, is bottled, you know, it actually could be, it's just a white wine. Um, so sometimes you taste the wine and, and you know that, that the way it's made, maybe it's because they make it in very large quantity um, and they have to kind of systematize, really have a system for, for the way the wine is, is made. So I think this is where, um, in, in a way, t- tasting is really important and, and people obviously know that, you know, I think, I think, you know, I remember I was at a Renaissance tasting with Nicolas Jolie actually a few years ago, and they had loads of samples because they, they, they do a similar system where they taste loads of wines together with all the, the committee. And Nicolas was like, you know, there needs to be a le- little element of a fault. You don't want, you know, the right. pro- too, too, too perfect. And in a way, it's that. It's That's like, part you of know, the profile. Yeah, it's part, yeah. Of, it's part, part of that. It's like that kind of slight spike. Uh, which you can taste, you know, the, the slightly flirting with fault, you know, is what makes perfect in, in, in a way, uh, which is something which I think is quite important. So, sorry, it's a long answer. Um, and I think there is a danger of, of, you know, really clinical wines being made out there. Um, as you know, I've always been, you know, which is why at Raw, at Raw Wine, I was always, I've always, encar- you know, encouraged people to be part of it, even if they're maybe a little bit, high on on the sulfite levels because for me it's really important to get on board that journey it's really important that growers start thinking that you know it is good to convert to organic it is good to start thinking about the fermentation process because it's a journey Um, but along the way we also need to be careful that we don't get people who make you know 500,000 bottles of organic correct wines and 10,000 bottles of natural wine which is happening so it's interesting for people to be part of raw wine in the fair. You have your vetting process, but like you said, you taste wines. So you've come across wines that kind of check the boxes. And then at some point you'll taste them and your taste will tell you this isn't yeah. work. Right. So that that's a reason for you. Fair enough to say, you know, I don't know if I want to yeah, make this. Yeah, or, or I need a second opinion, or I need to speak to right. growers. Right, but it, who are, it's a flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Way, you and know. you know, one thing is really interesting for me is like more and more, and I also do that with my business, you know, and more and more, I, I, I try to really trust my instinct 
and listen to my instinct. And, and I think when you taste the wine, if you just listen, if you don't listen to your head and you have all the paperwork in front of you, right. but you listen to what your heart and your stomach is telling you, you, you have the answer. That's what um, makes it genuine. You know, but you know, and, and you know, we don't have to go through your credentials or palate or how many wines you've tasted. You know, that's an important part of how you figure things out. Um, segue to something that I wanted to ask you. I mean, you've certainly You've certainly, you know, introduced people to wines that are organic, biodynamic. You know, people understand what low intervention is when it carries into the cellar. I'm just curious about these days. Like today, I'm hearing and talking to people where there's way more discussion and focus on farming, soil, regenerative. That seems to be, you know, a bigger topic because everyone says... Great soil, great grapes, great grapes, great wine. Am I right about that? Or that's just, it, you know, uh, who's the guy from England just wrote a book on regenerative farming, Jamie Good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it seems to, it, it's important. I, I mean, do you yep. agree that that's yeah, kind of that? Of course why, why now? I mean, it's about time, to be honest. Why not before? Is, True. You know, when, when we did our conference for Wine Alive, uh, you know, during pandemic, um, and it was all all about the plant, plants and all about, and in fact, everything is available on our website. So if people want to re listen back to all the, 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 all the talks that, uh, that we, we put on for, for, for during two days, I mean, they were really amazing. But that content was all about plants and farming. And the wine people said to me, a lot of journalists said, you know, you're putting on a conference, it looks great, but it's just really for plant people. And then the plant people said to me, ah, you know, it's, it sounds really great, but I think this is just more of a wine conference. And it's really funny That's that, funny. you know, the vine has kind of like, it's like you, you're doing a, a conference on cheese, but you're re refusing to talk about, you know, animal welfare, uh, you know, and, and, and where, where the milk comes from. But I think it's, it's about time. And, and this has always been, I think, for me, the most important is particularly given what's going on now. I mean, just, you know, more, more than ever, and we are running out of time anyway. But, you know, we, we have to really focus on the farming. Uh, the winemaking is, is super important, of course, but the winemaking in a way is more of a, is more of a stylistic, you right. know, sort of juggling and, and the final part of the cooking. But you want to get there with the right stuff before you even apply style or... Exactly. And in any case, you cannot make great natural wine if the farming is not up to scratch. You know, it's very simple. If people talk to you about difficulties of, of um, I don't know, um, acidity, pH, uh, wine uh, grapes are not really robust or the wine is not going to last for more than one or two years or three years, you know, it's because the grapes to start with maybe didn't have what it takes. And I'm not saying everybody has amazing terroir, uh, and you don't need amazing terroir systematically in order to produce, you know, natural wine. You know what I mean? With hills and poor soils and, and, and so on. Uh, but I think it's, it's it, we have to talk about the farming and, and, and it's, I mean, it's our duty, you know, we're an so industry like said, that relies on time. land. It, yeah, it, it's always been important, but now the discussion is more higher is, profile, which is, which is which important. Is great. Yeah. Because, you know, for so long, the natural wine debate has been dominated by how much sulfites and if it's a zero, zero wine, you know, and I have met so many people who <laughs> say they make natural wine, but then when you dig down a bit on the farming, yes, they might make zero, zero, but actually they might use Roundup and they might... Serious? Yeah, of course, because, but, you know... But that's like such extremes. Yeah, we're, you know, no we're, sulfur we're, and I'm using Roundup. But it's really easy, you know, when you are living somewhere far away and then you're selling your wines and they look a bit cloudy and you've got clear glass of funky bottle. You... It's really easy to say, no, I'm farming organically. Uh, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm sure there's people who come to the fair who may be using stuff. I mean, you know, it's it's hard to to be across everything, but it's yeah, it's absolutely the right it's the right the right way is to focus on the farming. That's yeah, that's I, the most important. Because making wine is nobody ever really disagreed easy. how important it was and you know discussed it but like i said i mean through my travels with the podcast and you know going to different things just people talk about it as much or more than anything um uh, yeah and and then i mean if i if i just may add something sure. on, on along the line of farming you know it's also the reality is not always easy um you know to sort of you know you have a difficult year you're about to lose your vintage maybe you need to use 
a product in the vineyard. And I think we can all understand that that's, that can happen. Uh, I think the key is, is, is transparency because I think, you know, I have like growers who are coming and say, look, you know, only half, you only use half of my production. I can, I can achieve to do it organically with the grapes. Uh, some of the other stuff I source, we're in, in transition with the growers. Um, so there, there's also, you know, there's also a, a dialogue. You know, we, I think we have to really understand the challenges and be supportive rather right. than say, well, come back in five years or, or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, like in, I, I'm literally just back from 12 days in Chile where I traveled everywhere visiting, you know, dozens of, of, of producers who make, um, natural wine and who farm well. Um, but there, there is, you know, some people buy grapes from all growers, all farmers. They maybe have a hectare. They have to use, you know, a bit of Roundup. Uh, so there's the education of like, because they've been doing it for a long time, you need to farm slightly differently. You know, this is, it's all a, it's all a process. I think our responsibility is to make sure that these growers can sell the wine at the at the right amount so then they can grow and then right. they can pay the, their workers better and I, I think that's you know we never really talk about that aspect I think when we talk about natural wine and we say oh if it's not zero zero I'm not interested or whatever but I think you know there is a whole social fabric behind these producers and it's dependent on you know it's it, it can differ from one country to another country you know is it a problem of getting workforce is it a problem of actually getting bottles to to bottle your wine is it a problem of because you've got like chile has actually not got a great image they're struggling to, to sell their wines at x dollars leaving the, the the property because there is an image actually chile should be cheap and cheerful and just mellows you know there's so many different and then they've got the pandemic you know like in 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 south korea is a real problem now why? By buying wine because of, because a you know natural wine was was very fashionable. There was a big bubble. Everybody was drinking natural wine. Now they're more into spirits and you know because and of gin. the pandemic. No, because because fashion, but also with the pandemic, uh, getting hold of the wines was not so easy over there. Right. So you know that people got refocused to other things. Yeah. So the the markets are ever changing. If you speak to growers, you know, uh, selling their wines can it's not always it's not always a given. Um, I'm curious about this. It's it's hard not to talk about climate change. You and I could probably do three shows in a row about it. But talk to me on this subject. People who farm thoughtfully, sustainably, organically, biodyna biodynamically, as climates change, and every region is different, so you just can't say climate change. Mm. What's going on in Champagne is mm. different than the Loire or in, and even in England and all that. Are because of these practices, I think I know the answer. Are they more well suited to kind of not fight climate change, but to deal with it? I mean, yes and no. You, you know, I think when everybody anybody's hit by like the, the wildfires, you know, that hit. That's drastic. I mean, didn't Chile have Chile, fires? Exactly. I mean, you know, I, I walked around vineyards that that been decimated but actually interestingly after a few months um you know a lot of the very old pais vines i mean some of them are not are not coming back but a lot of them are actually starting to become green again and the and the indigenous forests are you know the trees didn't quite die and they and they and they're re they're regrowing whereas like all the the eucalyptus and and the trees that were not not meant to be there are, are, are there's are a not. rejuvenation because of you yeah, because know you know, in in a way, I guess what's you know the, the native um, the native population li like you know some of the vines that like pais uh, are, are growing back. But um, you, you know, so so when you're faced with heavy floods, frost, uh, frost hail, hail, you know, there's nothing heat spikes. You, I mean, there's nothing you can do to to prepare yourself for that. But I think it's true to say, it's fair to say that if you are if you have, if you're working with a pool of grape varieties that are suited to your environment, that are not, you know, that haven't been planted because it's sexy to be planting Pinot Noir in a place where they should be growing Grenache, um, I think these grapes are a lot more resistant to to drought. Um, I think, you know, irrigation is a huge topic because a lot of vineyards, if you look at California, so many vineyards 
obviously are not sustainable and they're, they're, and, and what's going to happen to these vineyards in, in a you know in a few years time uh, so I think if you are working with um with grape varieties that are native so-called native or they've been around in the area for 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 a long time and and they were you, you know it's not a surprise that you know people planted Mediterranean grape varieties in parts of Chile or parts of California because that's what the climate wants yeah. you know um, and then and then I think it's also fair to say that you, you know if you work your your soil properly and maybe practice I, I visit a lot of people who, who really do no till uh, and for them you know that the, obviously there's a lot less erosion uh, the vine copes a lot better with a lack of water um, so so you know I think it's it's adapting the practices to to obviously to your region um, but they I see these vines are suffering a lot less. Um, and yet the, the 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 wine come come out with low pH, even though you know it's it's really hot and and and, and so on. So I think I think the farming is is helping the vine cause, cause better. And then if you have a vine, as you know, you know that is really connected to its environment, and the roots can grow uh, very deep. In fact, I visited a, a, a winery. I won't tell you which one it is um, in in, in Ch- Chile because it's irrelevant. But they have half of their vineyard is farmed organically, and half of their vineyard is not farmed organically. And when I looked at the non-organic vineyard, and I said to them, oh my God, this is not even organic. And they said, no, we've changed our practices and blah, blah. But they did, they, they, they dug a pit and the vines, and I said, what's wrong with these vines? Because all the roots were growing on the surface within 20, 30 not, centimeters. Not reaching down? No, it's because they were too much water, too much irrigation. And these vines then can't cope because you know, they, they're not they're not connected. Um, so, so, but I mean... You know, no one, no one, no one can cope with what's going on from a climate change because every year is going well, to be completely I, different. I think you made it clear that you know natural things out of our control, like fires, which a lot of them were started by man, but crazy rain, cold, and all of that. It's hard to combat that. But if back to farming, if you're looking at the right varietals, some people are talking about moving up in elevation or, yep. you know, things like that. Those yeah, are the... Coastal is what's happening in Chile. They're now looking for more and more coastal spots or further, yeah, further I, south. I think that's more practical than just looking for a solution, <laughs> literally, to pour on yeah. the, you know, vines, you know, to make them... Um, but, you know, how far is this going to go, though? Because I'm seeing, you know, like when I was we in Chile... We don't know. What I'm seeing... What, sometimes I'm seeing, like, hills or coastal places that where covered in indigenous forests you know native forests are doing really well and then people come with a bulldozer and get rid of everything build fake terraces plant vines because they need to be further up or, or, or in chile more you know closer to the coast or closer to patagonia or, it's like how you know how, how like you know we have a finite amount of territory that we can use i you know i don't yeah. know yeah so I mean, I think is, that's starting yeah. to become... Uh, oh, England, more, we get more and more people in England. Like, England is an amazing vintage this year because the weather was Is this beautiful. the sparkling wines? Yeah. But, but isn't that an example of planting a varietal in a region that benefits that varietal where maybe 25 years ago you yeah. wouldn't... You it know, wouldn't have been possible. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. because of the you know shifts in weather. Yeah, and that is true. Conversely, doesn't Champagne have to react to the changes there? You know, as far as either planting, not as bad. I think, I think, for the moment, I think they are, you know, in a good spot. But what's interesting is they're starting to make still wines. You know, right. they're, they're they're getting back into right. you know which what the region was doing. I think before they made made the bubbles, but they they you see more and more Coteau du Champenois, you know, still white and right. still red, which There's is a lot which of is excitement. great. There's yeah. a lot of excitement for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk to you generally, you know, about the fairs. I mean, I think one of the nice things, one of the nice things going on is, and you and I reminisced a little that, you know, we started talking in 2016. Since then, I mean, I've attended and I've also seen a lot more salons and fairs, you know, in the market, uh, in all the markets. Um, I'm not sure, you know, in 16, the first raw wine, that there was much other stuff going no. on. <laughs> no. um, I, I mean, you got to feel that you influenced that. 
I mean, the, the real hard work is your mission, yeah. which is representing these winemakers yeah. and, you know, getting them exposure. And then the logistics, which are a nightmare, getting mm. the wines here, getting mm. the people here, getting tables up and all of that. Um, yeah, the real challenge is, is that first one, two, three years, um, you know, where you're essentially, you know, and uh, like breaking into a market. And I know that we've, you know, I guess I don't really say this because you know, it's not really my my style, but I think, you know, I think I can say that, and I am really proud that we've had a really amazing impact on on the on the scenes where where we've where we've brought the fair. You know, I know that uh, if I if I speak to the importers now and we look back at 2016, um, you know, it's been really beneficial to have to have the fair and to create this kind of real momentum. Uh, bring people together, places like, you know, here at the Ten Bells, I know, right. are like really well, buzzing it, when the fair comes into town, it, which it is really amazing. an event, not just the one or yes, two days. Yes, it's a much bigger, It's really exactly. the, the wine really. makers touch, you know, the people in the industry and the consumer. I mean, there's a multitude of events, you know, which is really nice. Yeah, it's it's like a big thing. And then and then having an event like in New York where, you know, it, I would say it's... it's, it's um, it's a really nice, buzzing, big event. Uh, means I can also look at a place like Toronto. You know, we started Toronto two years ago. And Toronto is, a, you know, we have about 65, 70 growers. Um, the market is still quite small, but it's growing. Um, so in a way, you know, why why, why go and do a fair in, in, in well, places so funny, like Toronto? it's funny because Montreal has always been such a great, you know, market for yes, these wines. Great Montreal people is, promoting course, them. But and it's not is, like Toronto's the other end of the world. <laughs> I know, it's I the know. Same, but it's really it's a, a challenge. It's a very different, uh, yeah. very different vibe, yes, because Montreal is much more like restaurant based and, you know, in a way, yeah. got that kind of French gastronomical yeah. impact. But what I mean is like, it's really nice to be able to to do something in a place like New York, which is a big established market, and then be able to bring it to Toronto, where it's a much more event, you know, for us, it's actually a lot harder work to do a one day event in Toronto than it is to do an event in, 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 right. in New York. Right. But I it's nice it. to have this diversity because this is what really makes sense, you know, uh, uh, for us, it's like when we first did um, Berlin. I mean, Berlin year one was full of everybody but German. You know, we had tons of, at the time, you know, tons of Russian. Uh, we had loads of people from Eastern Central Eastern Europe, Europe. Yeah. Um, but no Germans. And now it's actually mostly a German event, you know, but it's taken us that long. And I remember I had a conversation with Frank Cornelison. He was like, you've got to go to, to Berlin. I was like, Frank, Berlin is like, yes, it's a great party it's a great party place, but, you know, it's like cheap place and people don't really spend money on wine. They don't spend money on food. He's like, we've got to do Berlin. <laughs> and I was like, OK, let's do Berlin. And, you know, it took us Were both of years. you right? You were yes, right in the assessing two, the market. Years. He was right. Every year I was just like, well, nobody I, I don't said know if it's we can easy do the it. first time around yeah. and you Second can't get year, discouraged. Like, I don't know if we can really do Berlin. And then, and then now, you know, Berlin is actually one of our most exciting fairs. There's so much going on. And I, you know, I really love, it's got the very specific vibe. But what I mean is, you know, that's what I mean. It's not, it's not just you pop in and then you do something, you know, the, the no. work we do is really profound you know it's about it's about really supporting a whole network of people who work with these growers you know when you come in and you 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 go and taste the wines you see kind of the the tip of the iceberg but really fundamentally we collectively have to change the way people drink wine, you know, and that's right. a big, that's a big, un big undertaking. So you brought up something and I, I observed something and I want to follow up. You talked about Berlin and German wines and, you know, how there's a, why are there so few German wines, let's say at raw wine, New York? Well, because, you know, we had, uh, there was the, the character fair uh, a week ago and I think a lot of them attended. Right. So that's fair. that's good and bad. I mean, you know, you always want to take care of your thing first, but it's okay for other people to do it, and that's that's kind of yeah, happens. just what happens. You know, I, I mean, I guess my uh, my and these my guys don't have a ton of money, and they can't <laughs> yeah, flit around to everything, and they can't stay in New York for a whole week. You know, I would love for you know, and I've I, I've spoken to them before. You know, I I would love for all these fairs to happen you know, like around this weekend, because then every, everything is happening around one weekend. You know, I think it's really hard. Uh, you know, that would be my, you know, I'd, I'd love like next year if we could do something like what happens in France where, you know, everything is kind of on, on one weekend or, you know. And everyone's Saturday, there for that. Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, you know, we're boom, boom, boom. 
two or three fairs, one long weekend, and then it's very efficient. All the growers are in town, you, you know, then it's, it would it would make sense, but you know we'll, we'll see. Yeah, um, well that but may it's just happen. What happens. Yeah, exactly. Organically, you exactly. Know, it just may seem like a natural thing years from now. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you ever have the fear that not necessarily being first, but bigger? You know, bigger is better because of the way you do this. But other people say they're so big. Our fair is smaller. You know, does that ever? I mean, not really. You know, um, I think I'm probably the only fair organizer that I know of that's um, full time. You know, I employ a team of people. This is our, our job, you know, and, right. and we do it really well. Uh, you know, I have web developers. I have two, two, two full time web developers. You know, I've got a production team, you know, the, you know the events we do. You know we do we do them well, and we take care of the growers. You know all year round, and and we maintain their profile. And I think. Well, that's a good point. You know what you do for the growers, because I think last year we talked about this a little, and there's a lot more to raw wine than just the physical fair. You know, there's the website, there's what you do for the growers, there's the mission, all of that. And that, you know, we're sitting here talking about natural wines and affairs, but the structure of your organization yeah, we really, really help them. Deep in helping and oh promoting, gosh. providing services. Yes, and, and then we, you know, we often and find. And it doesn't this- sound like an endorsement or I'm pushing <laughs> it. That's the reality of what yeah. you do, you know, which I think is terrific. But also, we often we find, uh, you know, with our network, we we match people with distributors. Uh, you know, I get a call. Oh, I'm, I'm losing my distributor in Toronto. Can you recommend anyone who who's doing what? Can you can you introduce us? I mean, we spend like a year year round. We do this for for which is normal right. because well. It's you know, it's a, you it's want a them community to, that's yeah, working they for have each to, other, you have to succeed. which is very important. So sure. I, I think the takeaway I get from that is this is what you do. This is what you do all the time. All the resources are there. You pour everything into it. That definitely differentiates you from other things. You know, you may be able to say, well, there's this wine fair and that wine fair. Or this one had more German producers. The, it goes beyond just the day of the fair and also the volume. I mean, how many fairs are you going to wind up doing in 23? In 23, uh, this year? Coming to the end of this year. Uh, eight. Right. Seven, eight. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, but it's, uh, it's, you, it is a full time. Oh, it is a full time job, and you know, and and also the the website. You know, we get which is why we've been having some issues in the past two or three days because we have had so much traffic. Yeah, what happened? I went to yeah. get some info. Oh my god! And then I saw. Oh. So the raw wine. Um, we were down. Website was down, yeah. and thoughtfully you put on social media that it was down. Which I thought, you know, sometimes people think, "Is it me? Is it my computer?" <laughs> you know. So that was, you know. Oh my gosh, this has been like a headache for the past three or four days. Luckily, not I, good I have timing, to say, right? it's the worst. I think it's because we have had so much traffic. Uh, we typically get about 50,000, 60,000 people using the site a month. Uh, so, but recently, we've had like a huge, so huge jump. that validates what I'm going to say, which is people should understand that it's a resource. It's not just a site to go to when is the next fair or who's going to be at the fair. Or, yeah. It's, you know, there's it's very well thought out and very informative about, you know, these type of winemakers, your mission, if people understand your mission, the vetting, the, you know, the quality, the code, the quality code and all that stuff, you know, that <laughs> it's all built. We built yeah, it all from scratch. I mean, it's very a, deep in a good way. Um, we um, mentioned something earlier. We're going to take a break soon, but I just wanted to follow up on this. Um, and, you know, you talked about it a little, I'll frame it a little uh, deeper, but a lot of these winemakers have sort of become rock stars mm. um, in their circles and even outside of their circles. Their wines are truly spectacular and there's no coincidence, you know, why they're so sought after. But it's like that Burgundy syndrome They're The wines are so good. They become so sought after. They become so less available and they're expensive if you can get them. And that's not what you set out to do. I mean, you set out to support these winemakers and make their wines popular. But that's kind of like a situation, right, where you have a lot of these wines. 
I mean, how do you feel about it? And I know how I would get around it. How would you? If there's a great guy making wine in the Jura, trust me, there's another guy. Well, exactly. You know, I think you know. Look, I think it's 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 only a good thing. You know, it's it's for so long natural wine has been seen as a glue glue wine to right. be you know you know uh, drunk uh, very quickly without laying Lower it down alcohol. and so on and i think i think the fact that some of these growers are now really highly sought after and people are collecting them hopefully people are maturing them in in cellars i think that's a really good thing because it, it means that there, it means that natural wine is becoming more established, you know, part of the establishment, which I think is, is you know, prob I'm probably going to get a lot of people killing me for saying this, but I think being part of the establishment can be a good thing. Um, I think it's good that we're, we're, we're entering uh, that realm because what that means is, like you say, you know, um, then in, in Jura, you know, a few growers really pulled the region upwards and leaving room for lots of people to be really inspired to find markets and i think we just need to work a bit harder at at finding you know different regions and different growers and that's the job of you know like people like here like with severin does an amazing job of of, of sourcing uh growers uh, like this and, and i think yes it but it's just what happens you know it's just it's just yeah. the market you know and it's it, it, but I think there's so it it actually really also inspires growers to to pay attention to these regions, so younger growers to set up to settle down, knowing that actually there is a market. Because again, it goes back to selling. If you are not selling your wine, you're not doing anything. You know, sustainability has be sustainability of running a business. We all know right. this. If you don't have the sustainability of running a business and paying, you know, for for your team and 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 making sure your family is looked after. Then, then you can't really grow, and, and and so I think, you know, I think this allows, you know, for more growers in Croatia and Slovakia and Czech Republic to actually be inspired in Germany mm. to produce more and more natural wine because, you know, people are doing it, and you know. You know, we talked about farming practices, cellar practices, characteristics of natural wine. I think you, not alluded, but discussed the fact that it's about the people, the people that make them you know, treating them fairly. It's about supporting a winemaker so that all his efforts are rewarded. You know, if he makes 2,000 cases, that he can sell them and put it back into the land and, you know, do other things and all that. You know, so we don't talk about that enough, but it's really the whole thing, you know, which I think is important. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking to Isabel Legeron. Isabel is the founder of Raw Wine. We have fairs coming up in New York, Toronto, Montreal. Um, and there's a whole schedule. We'll tell you where to go. Um, when we come back, I want to talk about those fairs. But as I did last year and as Isabel was moving towards, I want to ask her about that, you know, next region or what continues to be interesting or what should we be looking at for so you're listening to the grape nation on the heritage radio network we'll be right back hi listeners we wanted to let you know that heritage radio network's julia child fellowship application is now open the fellowship offers an enriching experience for aspiring food writers and journalists who share our passion for food systems change the fellowship is a great way to progress in the field of food journalism and digital media and will start in early January 2024. This fellowship will provide participants with hands-on experience, mentorship, and access to an extensive network of industry professionals. The application deadline is November 27, 2023. Check out heritageradionetwork.org and click on the Julia Child Foundation Writing Fellowship link to learn more. If you or someone you know has interest in food studies and journalism, this might be a great fit. Go to heritageradionetwork.org and check out the application today. Thank you. All right, we're back. We're back with my guest, Isabel. Isabel Legeron from Raw Wine. Um, Isabel, take a couple of minutes from all your expertise travels. You just talked about that you were in Chile. Um, are there... Up and I don't know how to phrase it, but you're going to know exactly what. Are there up and coming regions? Are there exciting regions? Are there regions that didn't get the attention that are getting them now? Is there, you know, are things coming into the fair that weren't there because you know they're making great wines? 
there's a lot to answer there, but give me a few takes on that. I mean, there's tons, you know, and that, I think that's what's really exciting because we, you know, not, wine is 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 such a, um, you know, it's it's really entrenched in in, in our culture. Uh, so, you know, whether whether you are in in Austria, Germany, Georgia. Um, you know, when there, when whenever there is also a political climate, that means you can you know you can make wine, but that obviously that's a different story. Um, so so there is there are new things coming up all, all the time, and, and because now the market is getting you know to maturity, there is it, it is giving you know these these growers um, room to 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 make um, to make to make more wine. And, and more people to come up on, on, on the stage, which is really amazing. I think we're still seeing, though, as a trend, I would say that people are still more excited about, I would say, old world or, you know, like the European countries. So I think, in a way, maybe it's, it's easier to break through if you're a grower coming from, from France, uh, from, from maybe Italy, Spain, or, you know, the central Europe. Um, Somehow, you know, I think there is this image of, 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 of I don't know, it's easier to, 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 to sell wines. Um, you know, I, like I said, I'm just back from, from, from Chile. And actually, because I, you know, I, I guess I, I love drinking pretty much anything as long as it's, you know, a, 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 a natural wine. Yes, a good yeah, natural a good wine. good natural wine. Yes, exactly. Um, for me, you know, all, in a way, all wines are completely equal, uh, but, but, you know, I, I realized by by being there that that there is still a a stigma around around Chile, and unless it's super cheap and you can get a very cheap base uh, that you can serve, you know, by the glass and and you know cheaply or, or in a bottle shop, um, it's actually a bit harder to sell wines which will sit maybe in the twenty five to thirty uh, dollars, you know, uh, upwards. Um, and, and that's actually quite a problem because when you are, um, and, and, and I want to talk about this because I think it's going back to, to, you know, to the social aspect of what's going on in a country, um, you know, like Chile has this unbelievable heritage of these old vines planted by the Spanish missionaries in the 16th century. Um, and a lot of these old vines are, are still there. It's a fraction of what was obviously planted. Some of these vines, you know, in the when you go to the Bio Bio, to the Itata and Bio Bio region, some of these vines are 100, 150, 200 years old. Yeah, they're huge. You know, they're like massive people. Uh, they are an unbelievable treasure. But because Pais is not very highly regarded in, 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 in Chile, they, you know, people can barely sell their grapes. So what they're doing is they're, they're getting rid of them to plant eu eucalyptus and pine trees for the paper industry, which are non, they are two non-native, uh, you know, tr tree, tree species. Right. And that's creating a huge problem. And then because people are leaving the countryside, they don't want to be in, in they don't want to be working the land because there's no, it's not glamorous. It's not, you know, now in France to be a new rural and to, you know, go back to like, you know, our good friend Severin here to go back to, to farming is seen as, as really, you know, amazing, which is, which is unbelievable. And that's a unique, that's an amazing opportunity. So how, how thinking about farming is, is, you know, is becoming, you know, it's becoming trendy. It's actually a good thing. Right. We were when talking you're in about Chile, that. it's not. Um, and, and so these growers who are doing really unbelievable work in these, looking after these vines, making natural wine in very traditional techniques, are actually finding it difficult to to you know, to, to sell their wines for 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 what what it, what it what it what it means, so, you know I would say underappreciated, uh, undereducated, yeah, and I don't market. know why it's a because yeah. you know, and and so I think I, I thought us natural wine people take time to look into things, but but, we, but that's still, that's yeah. your task to help. You know, there's more Ch Chilean winemakers at the fair. They're on the site. And we're working, you know, I had many meetings with, you know, like the government and we're trying to find ways and, and they already support growers to come to, to our fair, which is, you know, which is really amazing. Um, but what I, what I mean is, is like, you, you know, if you say to me, what's really up and coming? I think, I think Chile, even though we feel like we've kind of discovered the Pai story with these old grapes, you know, there's still a lot more to come from there. And I think I, I invite everybody to really support these growers and, and start 
tasting and drinking these wines made from old Muscatel, old Carignan. Uh, I mean, I, I, t- I tasted spectacular stuff. And, and it is available. It's not like it's not right. exported. Right, we're not talking about. Uh, but I think, we, And we, it's know, a great value. And it's an it's amazing value, and when you think when you you're you know you're sitting in these in these hills with these vines, I've been there for generations. They you know they've been through all of you know <laughs> the you know the, the setting up of countries and our, our our revolution back in France, and and they're still there and they're still making wine. And they are grafted, so they're not even on, wow. on on you know because there's no phylloxera in Chile. If this vine was anywhere else in the world, it would be a, a, a national treasure, and we would be running to just grab these wines. Uh, you know, we would the, the, you can get enough, but somehow we're not doing that with Chile, and 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 I'm really curious as to why. Um, but if if you if you take a, a moment to actually imagine what that landscape looks like and what these vines, what story they have to tell, you know, they have been through everything. You know, where we were just building up this country here. You know, in in, in America, they were still they were already making wine. Um, so I think it's it's it's. You know, Hopefully, we have to- it's a time thing. It's something that because of everything you described is all good and interesting that it's just going to take a little time. I know, but you know, they're running out of time because the problem is, is that these vines are being grubbed. People are not really, you know, some of these, some of these vines, the, the growers produce these, these grapes and a kilo of grapes, they sell for a hundred pesos, which is like 10 cents a kilo to big companies who just put it as, as, as bulk wine. We are still at that stage. So, so Anyway, I'll, I'll stop so, rambling on. But No, 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 no. I, I like the fact that, you know, we discussed and tasted the wine last year and that it's still important and, you know, there's sort of a cause to pay attention to, you know, that this is an interesting, important place, not getting the props, you know. Yeah, so if you're struggling to buy, to find a, a like a really good $25 French wine, which is made naturally... Then go to Chile because actually there's tons of really great stuff That's available. Um, let's talk about the fair a little. Um, we're going to move into the fair, which is kind of why you're running around. Um, I, I know I've asked you this in the past, but I think it's important. So the raw wine fair takes, we talked about, there were, you know, eight of them this year. Tell people about the fair. I'll set it up for you. The New York fair is in Brooklyn. It's in a huge, cool open space, 99 Scott Street. And take it from there. How many how many wine people and other beverages are going to so be? So we have, I think we have uh, 110 or 115 producers. And that's because actually we can't fit anymore. And I'm really excited to be back at 99 Scott, actually, because I we, like that, uh, space. that was the first space that we, you know, in fact, when I first visited that space in 16, when we were looking for a, a venue, it was literally an open shell. There, there was no flooring. There was no window. And the week before when I arrived, there was no window <laughs> and they oh, just boy. put flooring. And I was like, OK, I need a backup. And they said, no, it's OK. We'll get it done. And fair enough, they did get it done and there were windows. So the, the space was finalized. So, you know, we kind of grew with them. And now, now they're hugely, uh, actually, you know, they, they, they do tons. Yeah, they do tons yeah. of events and they've got a great team. Well, so, you had you a know, hand hats in off that. to them. But, you know, so you, you come over in. Over 100 producers. Yeah, hundred, over 100 which means producers. There's about 100 this, tables. Yes, exactly. And, and then the average there's producer... About, there's about five or six hundred wines to taste. Right. The minimum. average producer yeah. has two, three, four wines. Absolutely. And we've got, you know, people, I think there's like 16 countries represented. As usual, we've got tons Broken of by Georgian. Region. So if you go to taste Georgian wines, the next guy and the next guy are Georgian. You don't have to go to the end of the other side of the room. No, 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 no. And exactly. Yeah, no, I make an effort that it's actually, you know, really well organized like that. We've got you know, maps of the show and where everybody is. And this year we've introduced something we've actually started doing in Copenhagen where uh, people have different signage depending on, on their sulfite levels. Ah. Um, so we've we've categorized people, um, you know, all pe- people who don't add anything throughout the production process. They've got a, a color, I think it's yellow. Um, and then up to 35 parts per million, which is, you know, the, the kind of the 
AVN uh, levels, uh, I think it's pink, and everybody who's who's above that um, has, a, I think, a white. But we've, it's all written in the map. So I'm walking in. Yeah. Anyone who listens to this knows that. Ex- how do I know? Is that in the it's a, it's program? All, or it's in the program. Is and there it's an visually, explanation? Yeah, it's, it's, in, it's in the map that like you're it, getting. Uh, with, it, it would be lost if you didn't understand it was available. You <laughs> no, understand no, but my point? You'll be handed out a, 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 okay. a map. Uh, showing you where everything is and everybody's got a color code and then on the t- actual table there is a, also a, 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 color, a color code and this year actually very excitingly for the first time we're doing retail at the fair uh, which I'm really excited about we've never done it before retail really. wine so basically yes but it's we've, we've created with um, our, our, our partners who help us um, do all the logistics for you know the club we, we've, we've, we've offered to everybody at the fair uh, that they can set, sell their wines if they are obviously imported in the, in this country, um, and then we've created a Shopify sh- shop. Basically, it's just specifically for for the fair. So people come in. There's a a QR code so they can taste the wine. They 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 awesome. go onto the QR code. It takes them to the page of the producer. They can pick whatever wine. Uh, it's free delivery after six bottles. We ship to 47 or 44 uh, states, um, so they can come and taste. Uh, just to see how it goes, you know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll see. But what I, if I'm a small restaurant owner and I taste a few wines and can I get six bottles of this twelve? Can they do that or it's a consumer thing? No, I think then thing. they just need. Yeah, it's more of a consumer thing. They need thing. to go through there. Then it's better to go. Yeah, you'll importing. get a better yeah, price. Yeah. So that's uh, a consumer. Yes, exactly. So people can. We talked about accessibility, availability. These culty type wines. Here you go. If you like stuff, a lot of the people yeah, make it available. I'm really hoping. And then we've got so tons of wine producers, but we also have, um, you know actually a really great uh, cider producer Sin Patrones uh, who from, we, from, 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 from Chile who's a, a partnership with uh, Roberto Enriquez in the Bio Bio and I actually tasted through the whole range uh, last week because I was there it's really incredible stuff um, you know we have all sorts of spirits. We have, you know, there's is there something more, for everyone. Is there more showing of non-wine stuff? At this particular mm, festival, or there's a, always a little corner. Okay. I'd say about always like 10, 12, you know, non non wine, including ciders, sake, spirits, which is, you know, which is great, obviously. Right. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's it's very a corner. Uh, it's very bustling, and it could be overwhelming, but it shouldn't be because the people make the event. I mean, you're literally standing at a table talking to the guy who made the wine. Exactly. So I mean, that is what's better than yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And the guy is old, or woman, I, you know, I don't mean yeah. gender, but that person <laughs> will spend time with you and really tell you, yeah. answer anything and tell yeah. you. And there's a certain glow to yeah. all of that. And then there's all the talks, you know, you're, well, you're, let's talk you're about talking, that. you're doing. Well, let's get okay. to that because, you know, that's upcoming. Um, but it. I just want to see if it exists at every festival. The website we talked about, there's a lot of information, resource, education. Um, you know, you kind of carry that as a mission too. But in New York, and then tell me about the other festivals, you call it the Speakers. Speakers Corner, yes. Speakers so- Corner. And basically, the winemakers that are there um, or people you invited, you have a separate room where you get to see the winemaker talk. And more importantly, sample wine. So tell mm. me more about yeah, that. Yeah, so it's not the specifics, but yeah. I'll talk about New York. Okay, all right. Okay, well, we we you know education and being able to spend time with the producers and taking your time to taste wine is is a big part of what we do. And whenever I can, which is not everywhere, because like in Tokyo. There's no additional space, so you know, and we've got, and, and actually finding a space in Tokyo is a is a huge feat. Um, <laughs> so there's no speakers corner in, in Japan, for example, which is a big shame. Um, but whenever I can, if if there is space, then I always put on some some talks. And the idea is is yeah to just discuss. I mean, you, you know, we've done so some I'll, I'll, phenomenal stuff. I have the line up here. So in New York, um, and this is an example of you know other markets too. In New York, where you have the space, there's a separate room with long tables and you're given the glassware, the winemaker brings the wine. It could be anywhere from a few wines. So the first talk you're having in New York is Natural Wine Legends. It's celebrating the work of Tony Cotori. Tony, who's really one of the original, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, thoughtful farmers in California, Sonoma, is bringing wines back to the 80s through 2007. So here's an opportunity to taste these wines, sit and talk about them. And I'm just there to moderate stuff, (laughs) you know, and to keep 
the audience and Tony going. So that's one thing. And then if you thought that natural wine can't age, then this is well, the joke that the you can point. come. Exactly. You and know, we've done Radicon and Lorenzo absolute. Carino and, you know, the yeah. whole idea is to bring these wines out. Yeah. Then, so that's an hour talk. Um, I'm moderating that. Then from 1.30 to 2.30... Um, we're talking about aging natural wine, which Again. really specifically yep. gets into, wait, these wines don't age or can they age? So we're talking to winemakers from the Castilla y Leon region, mm. um, which is really a big and important you know, wine region and diverse in Spain. Um, and we're going to talk about the wines and more importantly, drink wines to prove, yeah. you know, and and idea, what they do and why they're ageable. And they're comparing basically one wine to vintages. So this is really about looking at one wine and how, what's right. the, what, what, what's the impact of, of age in that bottle? And it's a direct comparison, which, which is, um, so then like mini verticals with three growers. Right. Which is yeah. the best way is for comparison. Yeah. Um, and then our good friend Pascaline Le Peltier is doing the and exploration of Austrian diversity. Um, so she's talking about Blaufrankisch. We were just at a tasting with Blaufrankisch. We tasted like 30 wines. Oh, wow. So she's she's ready for this. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. Um, Austrian white wines, bubbles and all that. You know, so it's a thrill to taste those wines, to be educated, to have somebody like Pascaline. So that's New York, but that's really a fair snapshot of what the hell's going on. You're getting to taste wines, a depth, age, new, focusing on a region, discussion with the winemakers. I mean, that, you know, that, and that's why I say to you every year, you know, am I doing this with you or what? You know, because I <laughs> sat next to, was it Sasha Radicon and tasted a dozen of his wines? Yeah, wasn't I'm that like, amazing? I'm going to die. Know. You know? Yeah, that was really amazing. You know. And you know, it's also a privilege, like uh, for me, to, to be able to just take one hour and sit down and just have information, you know, sort of, you know, presented to me, being able to ask questions on a much more smaller, more more informal setting, very, you know. It's it, quite nice to just take that it's time. It's very accessible. Yeah, Everyone, it's, you know, could ask. And you're really tasting the wine with the winemaker. And even though it could be anywhere from 10, 12 people to 40 or 50, it's still very much intimate mm. in its feel and all of that. Um, so... I'm going to ask you this later, but it's a good time now. Um, with all the fairs coming up, and literally this weekend in New York, the best place for people to go for all the information is raw. So rawwine.com, yes, R-A-W-W-I-N-E.com. Our website is back and running. I've had Thank God. many people working a lot and of each, time. And each fair <laughs> is, out. you know, broken down with its own speaker. Yeah, there's corner. a microsite so right. on all and the fairs. And then fares. there's everything we talked about, all the winemakers, you know, yeah. all the info. What to eat, what to, you know, what right. which coffee supplier is at each fair right. and, and so on. Yeah, it's very right. comprehensive. So we'll people again i'm not gonna let you leave here i told you i warned you without answering our wineless questions here's the five questions <laughs> all right all right so mm -hmm. quick don't dwell on them we move through all right mm. if you can't do this who can so mm. what are you drinking now what what are you, are you drinking for the fair are there things like at home in the fridge or as you travel as the seasons change you know, what are you drinking now? Is it basically Chilean wines because you were there? <laughs> no, I mean, yes. I mean, I, I did bring a few things. So, you know, I, I, I opened a lot of those recently. Um, before I left home, I'm just trying to think what I opened. I, can't, I, can't remember. I, can't, I mean, honestly, I have so many um, bottles opened. Look, I... I you know, we, you, right. I know you asked me, I should come prepared for this because... No, like, no, 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 well, that's look, a fair the last answer. Thing, no, look, the last thing I drank, okay, before I came home, is we had a, uh, you know, I have a three-year-old daughter. It's called Sasha. And there was, it was just two days before I, I left, there was a big party in the woods with all of her little friends <laughs> and the parents. Okay. And, um, and I made, I opened loads of bottles and tons of stuff I had, and I made the most amazing mulled wine. Oh, with nice. a lot of that. Uh, nice. So that's, that's, you know, and I brought right, a so huge that's, pot of that for, that's a for good everybody. Answer. You know, your own homemade mold <laughs> natural, wine. Natural, natural, um, you know, wine with, with just organic spices and, and that. It and was, you know it was delicious. I asked people this question and it's fair how you answered it because you're running around like a maniac. You're dealing with a million different winemakers. You're tasting all the time for raw wine, you know, with winemakers. So it's a little bit of everything and then some mold 
old wine in the woods. We'll take that as an answer. Um, this is the silliest question, and I'm almost embarrassed to ask it, but now I want to ask it to compare to the past ones. Your favorite wine and food pairing, not what we think is a great wine and food pairing, but it's not something you eat all the time, but what's that great food and wine that you love? <sighs> Is it obvious or you struggle it's, with it? It's, it's really, you know, it's more and more to do with, like, the mood, who I'm with, what I feel like, what, what is my mood, you know, more, more than what I'm eating at the moment. But, you know, look, we're in autumn. One of my greatest passion is foraging for everything, but particularly mushrooms. So for me, there is nothing better than, you know, recently I, I came across a field of uh, chanterelle, wow. autumn, autumn chanterelle, and I, with Sasha, my daughter, and we picked like a basket full, um, and she actually loves it. She's, it's her favorite mushroom. And I just made them very simply with, with you know, garlic, uh, olive oil, and that's it. And then um, what did I have? I think we had... I think we had some orange wine or an orange bubbly. And I'm just trying to remember. Why does the who, bubbly work with mushrooms? Oh, nothing. I it nothing. Just it's just because then. I just wanted something a bit yeah. savory with a bit of structure. But, I, you know, quite refreshing, quite fun. So I always open the bottle. Sasha always smells so it. So you continue to forage with Sasha, right? Oh, my gosh. She I'll tell you loves why. it. She gave me the same exact answer last year. Really? Well, Which I go. love. It's not like, can't you think of something else? It's like, that's a thing. And it's, yeah. you know, your but daughter, now, time spent foraging, which is cool, getting her but, exposed to uh, you know, when I The was secondary amazing, thing is what wine? <laughs> What's amazing now is like this year, we were with all our little friends, or all three and four. And she was like, okay, so this is a mushroom, but we need to ask Maman because I'm Maman and my, my wife is mummy. So she said, Maman, and then she calls me, and then I have to explain what the mushrooms So she finds them, but she never touches them because she knows not to. Um, but then she was showing all her little friends about the mushrooms. So that, That's you cool. know, that was really sweet. I love that. Um, and it's nice that you continue to talk about it. Um, third question. This is not a hard question, but sometimes maybe hard for you to answer. The question, as, I, as I've asked you in the past, is your favorite wine restaurant and our bar. Take the word favorite out. OK, yep. what wine bars, what restaurants embrace what we've been talking about and what you've been doing it? I'll answer it first. Ten Bells, Sevi, what they've been doing, what they do is a place that has thought out wines, is a very cool environment. The people who serve it to you, you know, know what they're talking about. The list of food is thought out and compatible and everything. What other places <laughs> like that? Good pitch, right? Oh my gosh! I mean, you know, but you know, I, when I, whenever you ask me the question, I always, you know, come back to to Ten Bells. Um, there, there, you know, there are obviously tons of other other places. Uh, you know, what's important, and I'm not going to name any, but what's important, and, and that's why actually I thought coming here would be really special because, you know, this place has seen, you know, you were, you know, being here year one of Raw. Raw wine. We've seen. We've watched the elections here. We've right. tried here. The results. You know, it's been it's been ongoing. Um, this 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 friendship. And I think it's 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 what it's about. It's, it's finding a place that really knows the growers, so you don't get fed bullshit. Because there is unfortunately a lot of people trying to fob you a lot of wines that has nothing to do with with what what we're doing, um, and and that's why, for me, you doing the interview here is actually a really great uh, coming round you know, full circle because it's... So my takeaway from that oh. answer, and that's why I prefaced it and said, you know, think about when you answer this, you don't want to start ticking off places, but one of the things you did is you mentioned criteria. What makes, you know, people that know the growers, that curate the wines, you know, that can talk about a place that feels right. So Ten Bells is unique and it's not unique. It's unique because they've been doing it longer and before a lot of people, but now there's a lot of places like it that are good all over, whether it's Brooklyn, Montreal, or whatever. All right. Um, but I will think for next year, I'm, I'm going to come up with, uh, now that I know these questions are, are coming back every time, I will. Well, the other thing <laughs> is, God, you know, I have so much respect for Isabel, where it is, you know, what's good to her, you know, and I always say that it's not your top three list and it's not the only, it's just things that you think about, but I'm fine with and that. And things that are not fancy because I think, you know, yes, you know, I, I travel, I spend a lot of tra time traveling and I have been very lucky that I have eaten at a lot of 
what people would regard, you know, top places, right. you know, around the world, you know, whether it's Noma or You've worked with Cado people with in them. Copenhagen, like really, you know, like lifetime experiences. And that's really amazing. Um, and, and, and at the same time, you know, and these, some of these places are not always accessible and it's, you know, it's kind of, you tick them on your list, you know, because you've been there, but, and the experience is incredible. Um, but what's really important to me is like simplicity and, and coming somewhere where, you know, it's just like good food, and good the people wines there are get not it. extraordinarily that's the, expensive. That's the criteria. That's you know, and good ingredients. So I easier know that, said than done. Oh my gosh! Yeah, 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 you yeah. Know, it's very, so, very, yeah. very difficult. But you know, thought out ingredients, so you know that you know what you're eating kind of reflects your philosophy at home. Right. And, All know. right. Fourth question. This could be redundant, but maybe not. Um, when I first asked it in 2016, and I'm more curious how I asked it to you in 16 um, than how I do it now. The question was favorite all-time wine, and. Oh, but I listen, know what my but yes. listen, mm. and we'll get you're unique because <laughs> of what you do. But when I talk to a guy like Aldo Salm, you know, I, I was curious about what's the most expensive rare wine you ever tasted because you're around it. I started getting weary of that question and that answer. Mm. What became more important to me is Aldo, you know, you've been at wine at a certain level. What and here's the question: what's that wine that was important to you, either was a gateway, was awakening, changed the way you thought. Mm. That's just an important wine to this day. Mm. And it could have been like a champagne when you got engaged because mm. it wasn't about the wine, it was about the event. Mm. What's What are the wine or few wines that when you look back, is that an easy question to identify and answer? I mean, look, you, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me, and that's, I think that's exactly what I said to you probably in 16, 17, 18, you know, 20. Well, no, I may have answered it. Okay. I asked it differently in 16, okay, maybe, but it maybe, evolved maybe, to what maybe. you're going to tell me. Um, you know, for me, it's it's the wines from, you know, le, 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 you know, le Caso di Ma, de, de, du, Mayol, de Ma, du Mayol, and then um, Les Vins du Cabanon, you know, Alain Castex, who left us, um, you know, recently. Right. Um, because for me, you know, that day I spent with uh, him and Ghislaine, um I can't remember what, how, how many, 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 many years ago we were, you know, I spent the day with them and we had lunch, a picnic lunch, which was just baguette and some cheese and some, you know, um, pate in the back of their truck. And they opened Canta Manana, which to this day, you know, I, I absolutely love uh, for me, there was a, a very defining moment in that kind of it really cemented a lot of, you know, a lot it, of ways I've been feeling about wine. And it just suddenly together. I was just like, wow, this, this is, this is it. You know, if that moment, if I could keep that moment and I have actually in my, in my heart, there is a little capsule of moment, um, where I always go back to it, you know, because it's a very, it was a very amazing feeling of pure love, pure friendship, pure pleasure, pure beauty and you know drinking those wines was just like it just kind of it just filled your you know it filled my heart but and it, and it stayed with and me the, wines, mm. the people of the course. place the food so so you know wines from from le caso up to a certain point when you know it became you know became a different ownership and then Les Vins du Cabanon obviously um up till you know uh, Alain left us are like you know, and I have a lot of them, and I and I I've always bought a lot of them for for myself and 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 Deborah um, and you know and uh, yeah. If you said to me, you know, what is that 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 the thing that I that makes you know, sense. if it's, if we have a really special occasion, we just get a white from Caso or 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 a white from Cabanon or, or Cantamagnana from from Levan du Cabanon. So that's. Yeah. Um totally makes sense and that's the way you answer the question um those those are favorite all-time wines for all those reasons mm. that's all not mm. rarity not price more yeah. connection people you know all and incident stuff. incidentally they are actually really um, unbelievable wines in their own right you know they're they're, they're long-lived right it's they're not just exciting. a sentimental choice it, by the way they're very and good by, wines. and by yeah. the way they are amazing yeah. yeah um all right last question 
The question is, and I'll reform it for you, best wine around 15, 20, 22 bucks, American retail. Recommend a white or a red. You could do category like Muscadet is reasonable if you find the right. But here, here's the question. Mm. In the realm of raw wine and all the people you know, and Chile may be a logical answer, what's, what are the best values in wine if we look at a red or a white? And that could be region, maker, you know, whatever. So I think you have to go for obscure regions, obscure grape varieties, people who are just starting, uh, because the value very, is because there. very often you know this is you know they they can't really afford to come onto the market and and charge fifty bucks you know or, or have their wines be being so charged be, at fifty bucks. Try to get so you know for a okay second. so so regions of some regions of Spain uh, I think are still there's still a lot of really great wines. There's actually quite a lot of new growers coming up uh, from from that region uh, Slovakia I think is still actually a good source of of you know great value wines I'm just trying to think you know because I, I go through this process I regular every month to buy wines from 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 the club and you know at the club I try and have something which is a bit more famous a bit more expensive right. but then to, something to then where something, value yeah, to keep exactly. the price fair exactly and then um you know recently um well in fact in was it this month or last month? Uh, we had, in in fact, a, a Paisa is incredible uh, value from from money from Gustavo Rifo. Um, but then, you know, I'm just putting the the selection together for 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 for, for December, for example, and and there's going to be a really great uh, Slovakian wine, um, white or red, you know, red. Um, so yeah, I, I think you have to be a bit adventurous. I think we have to stop worrying about trying to to you know. Like you say, Burgundy is, is really tough. Um, so so for, 20, for, for unknown bucks. regions, I mean, Italy is still a great, great source. So you can still find some really, really great wines. Southern France, uh, you know, parts of Beaujolais are now becoming becoming harder. But right. they're still, you, you know, they're still, I think you just have to basically dig around a bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I think your answer is more. And Chile, of course. <laughs> right. I was just going <laughs> to. Is more the idea of looking for these up and coming regions. Um, and the value is there. Um, I didn't mention, but we post everyone's answers online. So I wouldn't put you through the pain of answering these if I didn't share them with people who are very much interested in them. So we're going to post those. All right, we're going to wrap the show up. We do a thing called the Weekly Wine Sip. As in years past, I've asked you to pick a wine that's kind of representative of everything you're doing. The winemaker the type of wine, you know, this type of stuff's at the fair, kind of checks the boxes. Um, so we're doing a blind yes, tasting. I brought, so I brought something blind. Um, I, I could just tell you oh, I'm sorry. effed. I don't want to say fucked, but I'm F here because <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, it's definitely a skin contact oranges wine. No idea of the grape. Is so it, I'll, I'll give you a clue. Is it a... Um, Okay. You don't want any clues. No, I want a clue. No, no, but no, I that's too late. Oh, that's it. too late now. Don't stop yelling at <laughs> is it. Is it something that's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Something that's well known or is it a little more obscure no, than the grape? No, it's something, well, I mean, the grape is not mainstream. No, no, but I'm beyond you know, mainstream. You know, I yeah, exactly. It's dig a, a little. Okay, is it so way beyond? I'll tell you. So first of all, it's the one you've had before. It's okay. a wine from a grower that you've met before and spent actually quite a long time with. And... It's a wine. So for me, this is, yes, it is orange. I mean, you know, the color here is very deep gold versus, you know, verging on on, on, on slightly sort of rusty is this color. Radicon? This is, yeah, Radicon. Jesus. That's but a, it's a 2010. It's, it's. Ribola Giala. Wow. In the In the small 50 centiliter bottles. And, and I wanted to bring this and I thought, you know, doing it blind would obviously just the add a bit freshness more. is amazing. But yeah, so, you know, when we first poured it and you put your nose and said, mm. and, you know, when we, you first pour this wine, it's interesting because I've, I've actually had this for, I've got quite a few bottles that I've been tasting regularly. Um, you get hit by the VA, right? There's a lot of VA. And then, which is why I said to Severin, can we decant it? Because uh, it really needs air. And then I think the, the, the VA really dissipates on, on the nose. The palate is incredibly vibrant, fresh, Zingy, you know, for it's got 14 years in the bottle. Yeah, it's got tons of life. And 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 for me, you know, when you talk about a, a, an orange wine, this is quintessentially an orange skin contact, really well made from amazing farming. 
that is still fresh, but also has that, you know, clear skin contact. And the uh, ageability has proven and itself. And the ageability, yeah. age you know, this is the one that would have been matured in, in large barrels for like, you know, I don't know, six, seven years before it was bottled. Um, so, and, and, you know, because this you spent time treat. with Sasha um, and obviously Stanko, you know, left us. And, you know, yeah. his, but his legacy. What did we taste? But, like eight, 10, 12 wines? Yeah. It was, that, on that vertical, to be honest, that was one of the greatest. So tasting. if you know Radicon, you know this wine. It's the Radicon Modern, the blue label. Um, and this is the Ribola Giala. The, the Ribola Giala, the you know, 10. with the line going up. 2010. Yeah. I'm going to take a bottle shot and I'm going to post it. Um is this a 750 or less? No, it's 50 seal. You yeah. know, this is the bottle they, they developed in order to be able to use. For them, it was a perfect ratio. We talked about that. Yeah, exactly. For, to be able to use these uh, corks that right. are wild right. cork and yeah. all of that. So it's less always a pleasure. Too. Very uh, cool. And, you know, I had it, you know, I flew with it yesterday. So um, I'm always a bit it's a, worried, it, but it's in an impeccable you, condition. You, you outdid yourself. So <laughs> we tasted the 2010 Radicon. Ribola Giala. Ribola Giala. Um, kind of a legendary winemaker. Um, he works with these varietals, their skin contact, and they're unbelievable. Um, mm, sometimes so available, sometimes hard to get. But if you see them, you get them. And he's coming. So he's not coming to New York this time, but he'll be in Montreal. Uh, so you, you can come yep. to, to Montreal next weekend. He'll be up and in Montreal? Yeah, or yep, the yep, wines yep, will be yep, there? Yep, yep. I think, yeah, him or his sister. Right. Would be as boring. long as somebody brings the wine. <laughs> right. yeah, exactly. His grandmother could bring him. I'll talk to her, right? All right. Um, Isabel, we have to wrap up. Um, we have to wrap up because you're busy and uh, you have things to do. So let me do a quick wrap up and I want some more info. So if you have a question, suggestion, wine happening or event, hit me up at Sam at the Grape Nation dot com. That's Sam at the Grape Nation dot com. Subscribe to the Grape Nation podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or on Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your pods. There's a lot of other carriers. If you like the podcast, leave a review. You can follow us on Instagram, where I will be posting Isabel's wine list and what wine we drank. Um, Instagram, we're at S Ben Ruby on Twitter, or now X, we're at Ben Ruby. But you can always get to us by the hashtag The Grape Nation. Uh, Facebook is easy. We're at The Grape Nation. Um, like I said, we'll post all of Isabel's wine list picks, weekly wine sip, and info on the fair. Um, Isabel, let's tell people once again we have fairs going through the end of the year and a schedule for next year. The best place for people to get information is it's coming to our website, uh, rawwine.com, R A W W I N E.com. And also, if you're based in New York, there's a bunch of events happening this weekend all Talk. around the fair, uh, including here. I mean, Den Bells is hosting the official opening and closing party. And I think it's going to be like 30 growers pouring their wines here on Saturday night and, and Monday night. So there's tons of stuff happening around the fair, but it's all on our website. If so just anything, head there kind of shows you what the event is. It's coming to a place like this with the winemakers pouring their wines. But by the way, that happens in other markets too, to different extents. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, you know, yeah, you absolutely. pick your venue, the winemakers will come by. So yeah, that's yeah, a nice yeah. thing. But everything is on our website anyway. Yeah. Um, even the outside events? Like yes, you, you it's called Raw Wine Week. Right. So there's a section on, on right. every there's... single microsite and they're, all the events are listed Perfect. there. All right. I want to thank our guest, Isabel Lergeron. Um, it's a treat every year to do a few things, and that is to talk to Isabel and get her take on it because she works so hard on everything, and she takes a moment to tell us about it. Um, so thank you again, Isabel, for coming in. Thanks to our engineer, Armin, and everyone at the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.